In Singapore, three homes go up in flames every single day. I want to know what the common causes are. So I wrote to the Civil Defence Force, the people we call in the event of a fire. This is their reply. The incidence of home fires has actually gone down over the last five years by around 30%. But one thing does stand out. Despite fewer home fires, the number of injuries and deaths from residential fires has more than doubled between 2019 and 2021. Have home fires gotten more deadly? That's what I'm about to find out. I'll also be revealing if your home is a fire risk. So stay on because this episode could just save your life. I'm starting my investigation with Yi Po Kim. His job is to ensure that buildings in Singapore are well protected against fires. Why are the number of fire injuries going up even though the number of fires are going down? People are getting more influence, so they're buying more things. They have more electronic gadgets like your laptops, your tablets, your PMD, your okay. PAB, all these things you need to be charged. During charging, you may create heat and if these things are not properly attended to, uh -huh. it will overheat it. In time to come, it will okay. cause the fire. Then in think of fire, those electronic items will block the access way. You will block your way to escape. Okay, so, so in a way, we have more stuff. It's all over the place, there's a, a higher chance of it catching fire because many electronic devices and when we need to escape, it takes longer. Yes. How are these electrical fires happening? Uh, let me show you. Ah, okay. I have a setup like that at home too. I guess that's no good. Of course. Just imagine one switch socket outlet had to bear so many outlets points. Yeah. So all these are drawing the power from one single switch socket outlet. This oh, is really? a hidden hazard, yes. So see, this is the typical layout okay. of the yeah. C-socket outlet. Looks alright. So alright, you look alright. The thing is, if these plugs are overloaded, mm. so you will generate heat. Okay. So when you generate heat in times to come, this cable will get frayed. So when you get frayed, it will generate more heat. So I eventually, see. they will cause fire. Considering I might have a hidden hazard in my home, I want to see for myself how an overheated socket can cause a fire. Oh, oh. I think it's starting to smoke. Oh, whoa. Oh. <laughs> now it's really on fire. The, what happened here is due to the overloading of the cables. Uh -huh. So this fire starts almost simultaneously. Furthermore, this thing is hidden. And by the time we see it, by the time we see it, it's too late, it's fire. Well, that's scary. Scary enough that I'm rushing home to make sure my sockets aren't overloaded. Who would have thought an innocuous looking power socket could cause such damage? Which makes me wonder, are there more such fire starters lurking in our homes? I've roped in fire forensics expert Andy Chu to help me with my next task, inspecting three homes for hidden fire dangers. We have shortlisted three types of homes, a four-room flat, a condominium unit and a masonette. Please come in. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Hey, hi. Hello, hi. hello. Come in. Hello. Come in. Hello. Thank hello. you. Hi. Welcome, welcome to my house. Are you ready for the house inspection? Yes, okay, I am. Okay, man. So this is your kitchen. Uh, well, I do. I do see something that is not that right. Okay. Oh, behind the... This is the dryer, right? You mean all these rags? Yeah, I mean, uh. we have rags and they are placed directly behind okay. the dryer. And when it's being operated, there's definitely going to be heat, mm -hmm. right? So we wouldn't want uh, for any long-term exposure to heat and after which then you will start burning. Can I just ask you, mm -hmm. what, is, what is this space for actually? Actually, this place is specially dedicated for my children where they have their break time. The only thing that I would like to say is that this down lights over here, mm -hmm. um, if the scenario is light on fire, light drops down, mm -hmm and this kind of material is going to catch fire. Okay. So okay. what you could do then is that just remove this little thing mm -hmm. so that if there's any drop down, mm -hmm. there's no problem. It just drops on the hard floor. You just continue flaming until it burns out by itself. I'll make sure that it's done. 
All right. This is the sure. living area. We'll just take a look at what is inside yeah, over sure. here. Um, this plug, you'll notice that it is not pushing all the way mm. to full okay. contact. Because it is non-full contact, um, it could lead to a little bit of arcing and arcing will mean that electricity will try to jump you know, mm -hmm. between conductor so and conductor. So another spark. Uh, spark and create a very localised heat source. And imagine if this ignition source is to start sparking, um, it's going to start to heat up this space inside there. Ah, this is your parents' room? Yes. Okay. So over here, we have charging of a phone um, next to the corner of the bed head over here. If anything is to happen and this becomes a heat source, we are looking at this curtain easily igniting as well. All those wires are also hanging around, right? Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me just have a look. Um, we have very light over here. Let me just try to trace it and... Oh my gosh. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't think this is the right way of doing it. Did, did you do this yourself? No, my dad. Well, that's something they got to warn him about. Mm. Um, there are people who are more than qualified to do this connection for you guys. Mm -hmm. Why is this dangerous? We do not know much about circuitry mm -hmm. and stuff like that. It could lead to another fault. And it being a fault could lead to heat load. Mm. So we have one, we have two, we have three, and we have this thing which is four over here and it's like, yep, all waiting Yikes. to light up this. Um, Roshan? Yes. Can you be able to share what this is? Plug to? That's plugged to my sofa, which has uh, electronic reclining type things. Can I just have a look at it? Sure, please. Let me just check. Okay, there's a safety mark over here, as you could see. So, well, I can trust it. Okay. Coming from manufacturers. Um, but that said, I wouldn't practice having that slip of paper placed here. Oh, why not? Because these are hot. Right. And whenever it's hot, it's possible to ignite anything. Mm. If, it's, if you have any combustibles or anything nearby. Okay, ah, I guess this is your home office, right? Yeah, sort of home office. Well, what do I see over here? Ah, that might be a candle. Would you be able to share how is the wind over here like? Uh, generally, the wind is quite strong, especially if I leave my windows open as well as the main door. Then there's ventilation and it comes through this way. I wouldn't want to place this directly behind the curtain, right? Especially when they're all combustible. So if I really want to have it lit, I'll place it mm. somewhere else. Further okay. away from the yeah. curtain. There are spots around our homes that could unknowingly start a menacing fire. And I'm about to find out just how big a place can get. Well, Steve, your living room is one huge petrol bomb. What? Fuel, heat and oxygen, all that's needed for a fire. Fuel in the form of combustible materials found all around your home. Enough heat to raise those materials to a high enough temperature and enough oxygen to sustain the fire. Now that's what we call a fire pyramid. A healthy supply of combustible material like cloth, paper, in other words, fuel, would sustain a roaring fire. But how much fuel is there really in my home? Now an object's fuel load determines exactly how combustible it is. For example, a waste basket has around 15 kilowatts worth of potential fire energy. A sofa has more than 3,000 kilowatts. But all this means nothing to me without a reference. Hey Andy, what's with all this? Well, Steve, you ask about the amount of fuel load in your house. Okay. Right? Your living room is one huge petrol bomb. Each of these represents 100 litres of petrol. Okay. And this is the amount of fuel load in your living room. This means that when the items in my living room catch fire, it will be the equivalent of setting all these bottles of petrol on fire. 1,600 litres of petrol. Talk about an inferno. Starting with the TV console, okay. would you want to hazard a guess how much of petrol it is equivalent to when it's burning? Okay, so equivalent to the TV console, I say maybe... Doesn't look too big. Just one? 
Well, in fact, it's about two, which is equivalent to 200 litres of petrol burning. Wow, okay, just from that little thing. Yeah, it is. Would you want to hazard a guess how much of the fuel load your piano is? Piano? Um, okay, lots of wood. Uh, yep. I would go... Four? I'm looking at five. Five? Yep, 500 litres of petrol burning together. All these are modern materials. Uh, modern material meaning like plastics, polyurethane foam, and all kinds of hydrocarbon or oil-based organic compounds. They actually burn very fast. Okay. And these were fast burning fire. So does a fast burning fire lead to a more deadly situation? When we're talking about fast burning fire, there is a higher chance of cutting off your escape route. And it also means that it creates um, smoke faster, leading to smoke inhalation and burn injuries, okay. or even death. How long will it take before the whole place is on fire? It based on be... material, based on the space, based on yeah. ventilation, it is as fast as two to three minutes. What? I think I might think of it living a zen lifestyle, just sit on the floor, no sofa. Two to three minutes to raise a home to the ground. If you think that's enough time to escape a burning inferno, well, take a look at this. This is a model of a typical three-room flat. Let's assume an electrical fire has taken place just behind the TV and the curtains catch on fire. The fire is now spreading into the walls of the home. It's been burning for about 50 seconds now. Look at that fire go. The entire living room is burnt up. At this point, in just 50 seconds, the exit area of the house is now in flames, preventing any access or exit. There is no longer any chance of escaping from this apartment. All exit points have been blocked by the fire. I have to step back because I can feel the heat. If a fire really were to spread this fast in your flat, how do you get out? So let's say my house is on fire or my neighbor's house is on fire. Yes. What are some of the things I can do to increase my chances okay. of survival? So in the case of a residential fire, mm. we have to always remember and apply this rule known as RACE. So R is, stands for rescue. Uh -huh. So rescue any members of your household that are in imminent danger of the ongoing fire. Okay, makes yes. sense. Followed by A is to alert. So we have to alert the rest of the neighborhood of the ongoing fire uh -huh. and to dial 995. C is to contain, so to contain the fire. Uh -huh. So is to close all the doors and openings before we leave the place of fire. Mm. It helps to delay and to prevent the further spread of the fire. Ah. So R, A, C, and now E, what's E? Let me show you, Stephen. Okay. Oh, whoa! Wow, I can feel the heat from here already. <laughs> And you brought me here for okay. the E. For, for the E, extinguish. So the rule that I told you earlier was race, right? R A C E. Yep. Yep. So now, okay, to extinguish the fire, always remember pass P A S S. Where there's a fire, okay, yep. we actually pull the pin, the safety pin. A is to aim. So right. aim at the base of the fire, followed by S is to squeeze the lever. And lastly, S is sweep okay. from left to right. Okay, so it is pull, aim, squeeze. Very well done, Stephen. Okay, so will this put out all kinds of fire? No, Stephen, this is a CO2 fire extinguisher. For residential, I recommend for the dry powder okay. that puts out class A, B, and C fires. Yes, so A being the paperwood combustible, right. B will be the flammable liquids when we are cooking, mm. and C will be the electrical fires. So Stephen, the two tips I've taught you on race and pass yep. is to mitigate the fire while SCDF are making their way to the scene of fire. Okay, so it's really to just buy you some time. Yes, to buy How us some time. How long does it take for SCDF to usually get to you? Usually it takes them about eight minutes to reach the scene of ah. fire. The Singapore Civil Defence Force, or SEDF's response time to a fire is eight minutes. But the fire response time for other built-up cities like Hong Kong is just six minutes. Tokyo averages six minutes, 29 seconds. That's not all. 
the number of fire stations and smaller fire posts per square kilometre in Singapore is about one fire station for every 14.3 square kilometres. But while we do have a slower response time and fewer fire stations per kilometre square, compared to Tokyo and Hong Kong, the SCDF says Singapore has one of the lowest rates of fire fatalities and injuries in the world. I've learned some skills that can certainly be helpful if I'm ever trapped in a fire, because every second counts when you are trapped. Potentially, you can pass out in a matter of five minutes. This is a fire box, and fire departments use this to study the behaviour of fire and smoke in enclosed spaces, just like our homes. I'm going to light it up to see what happens. So in just a few seconds, you can see the smoke layer is building up. There's lots of black smoke. There's just too much fuel. We see it from the, the sofa. And not enough oxygen. This causes incomplete combustion. That results in all that black smoke that we are seeing and this can spread everywhere. And, oh, I can really smell it. I'm getting choked up. According to the Singapore Civil Defence Force, in fatal fires, more people die from smoke inhalation than burns. What are the harmful effects that thick black smoke has on our lungs, airways and bodies? This is a picture of our airway. So when you have smoke inhalation injury, there's actually damage to the airway here and it can get swollen and can get blocked up. So when it gets blocked up, there's, you can't deliver oxygen to the lungs and to the rest of the body and most importantly, you can't deliver oxygen to the brain. So patients actually die of what's known as hypoxia or lack of oxygen to the brain. The brain is extremely sensitive to oxygen deprivation. That's when hypoxia happens. This results in low levels of oxygen in body tissues and if it persists, victims can suffer seizures and go into a coma before eventually succumbing to brain death. The other way it can sort of cause death is by something known as carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide poisoning restricts oxygen to the brain, causing symptoms like dizziness, confusion and loss of consciousness. People may have irreversible brain damage or even die before the problem is discovered. How soon can it happen? How many minutes do I have to...? So it really depends on if you're in an enclosed room mm -hmm. in very thick smoke, potentially you can pass out in a matter of five minutes. Have you been seeing an increase in this trend of uh, inhalational injuries? Uh, unfortunately, we have. For the entire year of last year, we had 35 admissions for smoke inhalation injury. But for the first six months of this year, we have already seen 28 cases oh, thus wow. far. Yeah, these are all linked to fires and namely, mainly house fires. Most of us live in HDB flats here. So yeah. let's say I'm trapped inside, a fire starts. Yeah. A smoke inhalation is very likely. Yeah. What can I do to try and prevent as much of that as possible? You should keep as low as possible because smoke actually rises up because of the okay. heat. So keep low and then if you have access to a cloth, wet it and then put it over your mouth and your nose because by having the wet cloth there, it actually helps to filter out some of the carbon particles. Uh. So you breathe in less of that. And of course, if, you, if possible, try to get out as soon as you can. There are ways to minimise your body's exposure to smoke in a burning house. But even if we're lucky enough to escape unscathed, there's still a burnt shell of a home to deal with. What happens next? Hey, hey Helen. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me over. Well, this is a nice place. Thank you. Let me show you. Okay. This is Kaina Lau's newly renovated four-room flat. She wasn't intending to do up a home, but then this happened. My mom heard it first. Yeah. None of us actually heard the sound until she started to scream in the middle of the night. So it was about 3 a.m. at night. None of the air conditioning units were on, mm -hmm. um, but specifically that air conditioning unit was the one that um, randomly sparked. 
and oh. yeah, and it fell onto the couch right below it. Um, once the, the couch caught fire, the painting caught fire, and that's when then the rest of the house got impacted. And then as for the smoke damage, um, it reached um, every other part of the house. Well, how much did, did all the, the renovation cost? So it was a total about a 55k. Okay, you didn't have any home insurance for your own mm -hmm. stuff in here? Yeah, no, we didn't. I think uh, in hindsight, we really wish we got it. $55,000 to fix the destruction of a house fire. That's a high price. I need a better solution. When people get their homes, they are told that they have fire insurance and they thought that you know it covers everything, but it doesn't as you can see mm, yeah, yeah. earlier. So what actually is the difference between fire and home insurance? When you have a HDB or a condo or landed property and mm -hmm. you have a loan, whether it's with HDB or the bank, for the banks, they will require you to get a fire insurance with their appointed insurer. Okay. okay. For the HDB, they require you to get the HDB fire insurance scheme with their appointed insurer as well. Take a look over here. Imagine you just got the keys to your house and you open the door, it's an empty, unfurnished yep. house. And that's basically what is being covered by the fire insurance. Ah, and it only covers that? Yes, correct. So this is layer one. Okay. So layer two, what you're going to do next after you get the keys to your home, you're mm. going to renovate, okay. right? Mm -hmm. You're going to add in your carpentry that's denoted by these brown boxes over here, right? right? Your kitchen countertops, cabinets, okay. building wardrobes, aircon, all that kind of stuff. And these are not covered by these uh, insurance policies oh. that's appointed by HDB or the bank. And layer three, as you can see, the major items would be your beds, your yeah. dining table, your coffee table, sofas and your TV, you need a comprehensive home insurance that covers all this. So not only does it cover these three layers, uh -huh. it also covers personal liability. And roughly how much would home insurance cost? Well, there's a wide range. It depends on your dwelling, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's a HDB, condo or landed property and how much you have spent on the mm -hmm. house, right? How much you have spent on the furniture, the fixtures, the renovations, okay. all right? So it can range from maybe $50 a year to a couple of hundred dollars a year. The dangers of home fires are varied and sometimes hard to determine, which is why besides getting the necessary insurance, I've also gone out to get a fire safety kit. In it, I've got my smoke alarm, which is mandatory for all homes in Singapore that are built from June 2018. Also a fire extinguisher, dry powder version for those small mishaps, and a fire blanket. Because all these could very well save your life one day, like now, whoa! 